morning. I would like to share some thoughts with you about the role of urbanization and poverty reduction. This joint work with Joachim de Weert and Yasuyuki Todo from the University of Tokyo. The world is urbanizing rapidly. It may not come as a surprise to you, but we know this. This is being talked about, but already half of the world's people live in urban areas today. And by 2020, we expect the same uh, for the people in developing countries. Half of the world developing country world's people will be living in urban areas. So that's sort of no, we, we hear about it, we talk about it, but I think what's much less no is that the urban world is also concentrating rapidly. It's not just that pe more people live in urban areas, but actually the more of the urban people are also living in fewer cities. So when I talk about concentrating, basically you talk about the number of people number of urban population, the amount of urban population which live in one or two uh, cities. So basically, we expect another one billion people in the developing world to urbanize, to move to, to, to cities. And out of these, this one billion, we expect, or the projections are, that about two-thirds, 660 million, will actually be living to, will be going to cities larger than one million. This is quite different from in the past. But in the past, basically, over 1970 to 2010, there were about 2.2 billion people going into uh, urban areas in the developing world. But at that time, there was only 1 billion who actually went to big cities, uh, to cities larger than 1 million. So urbanization is happening. It's happening rapidly. But more importantly, or that's what we would like to draw attention to, is that on top of that, the urban population is also concentrating. This is also happening in Africa. Already, about 40% of Africa's urban population lives in big cities, cities of one million or more. About the other 40%, they basically live in small towns. And you sort of see this distribution here is from the census data, uh, about 40 countries in Africa, 1990 uh, to 2010. Basically, you sort of get these two bumps here, where sort of you see concentration in, in the big cities more than one million, and then sort of another concentration here, here sort of centered around 100,000. So this is happening, and again, if you look at the growth rates over the past 20 years, you see that the big cities have been growing at 6.5%, sort of, sort of metropolitization happening, while the small towns were growing at 2.4%. So urbanization is happening, on top of it you get urban concentration. Why should we care? One reason why we make care is to sort of read and get some ideas from uh, Professor Henderson, Vernon Henderson, who is an urban economist, and he wrote an article in 2003 in the Journal of Economic Growth. And basically, looking at the experiences across the world, he was finding that the degree of urbanization, whether you're 50, 60, 70 percent urbanized, as such does not matter for how fast you grow. But there seemed to be an optimal degree of urban concentration. The amount of people, the percentage of people, the share of the popula urban population who lives in one or two cities. So that seemed to matter for growth. There were some points at which you were, could be too concentrated. Instead of having a spread out urbanization pattern, too many people live in Paris, too many people, or all of your urban population lives in Kinshasa, that may not be a good thing for growth at some point. Now, what about poverty? What about the distributional effects? This is a conflict about inclusive growth. What about the effect of an urban concentration on poverty, the rate of poverty reduction, shared prosperity? And there's very little literature on that. It's actually both theoretical as well as empirical. There's very little to find. And yet, this is the question that countries are facing today. China, India, they're bracing themselves for megacity development get another wave of urban, urban migration uh, in, in China, and where the Chinese government increasingly are focusing on trying to house these people in big cities. Vietnam is facing the same challenges. Rural migrants are coming into the cities. Are they all going to be concentrated in Hanoi, Da Nang, uh, Ho Chi Minh? Or is it better to sort of have a buffer refuge of secondary towns around it so as to catch that wave of new rural migrants? Africa, we know, urban concentration is already high. And yet, again, as you put yourself into a certain position, as you put the infrastructure in place in, in these cities, in doing that, you also lock yourself in, in a certain pattern. So if there is some relationship, if there is a, a relationship between the degree of, of the rate of poverty reduction 
and the degree of urban concentration, then basically you're setting yourself up for a certain pattern of development. So that's why we would argue that this is important. Now, again, it's not so obvious immediately why it would matter or how it would matter. What, what could be reasons behind this that sort of a, a metropolitization would lead to slower or faster poverty reduction versus a rural town, more, a more spread out urbanization pattern? So if you look at the literature, one, one reason it could be sort of has to do with agglomeration economies. If people come together, live together, or densely together, then basically you get the activities are concentrated, and there could be economies of scale. On top of these economies of scale, if you have your, your suppliers close by, if you have your customers close by, the service providers close by, you sort of get all kinds of spillover effects. It reduces the transaction costs. Or even further, there could be knowledge spillovers. So all these, this, this very fundamental, new, since 15 years, it's, it's high on the agenda, the idea of agglomeration economies and how agglomeration economies drive economic growth, sort of intermediate, you have an urbanization process in there, would sort of make an argument that from that perspective, it may well be big cities, it may well be metropoles, which are important for economic growth, does job and creation, and then depending on who gets the jobs, uh, also poverty reduction. But there's sort of from an agglomeration economy point of view, there's a big argument for sort of a metropolitization. Now, in this literature, even though it's a very dominant and very strong argument, there are also quite a bit few caveats in terms of the empirics of it. And these agglomeration economies may not be equally important for all industrial activities or for all activities. If you do textile, if you do agro-processing, it may not be as important. You may not need such a London-type city or such a big city to capture the agglomerate or the economies of scale needed for, for that uh, activity to flourish. Similarly, there is actually quite a few other reasons why we may observe metropoles which have to do with the politics. There may be an urban bias. There may be a metropolitan bias. It may be in the, in the interest of political uh, elites or elites to sort of concentrate Cap bring industry to more metropoles because that gives them an opportunity to do some rent seeking by issuing the permits and sort of let them pass by them so that they have opportunities for rent seeking. And finally, also you have congestion, of course. As things get more concentrated, there's also congestion. It's very hard to estimate that as well. But by and large, that literature would, would sort of predict, would say, you get big agglomeration economies that would sort of accelerate growth. Now we come from the other side. Secondary towns, you come sort of from the rural non-farm employment literature. Secondary towns, smaller towns are known to be important as mediators for the flow of goods and services between the rural hinterlands and the larger cities. And sort of, they basically are important for generating rural non-farm employment. And rural non-farm employment is important, or has been documented to be important for poverty reduction. Now again, why would that then link with, with sort of what could be reasons why the poor may find it easier to find jobs if these rural and farm uh, jobs have to be generated? Is that better for them to be generated in, in small towns or big cities? Sort of one could think of a theory, sort of a Harris Todaro type of theory, where you say, look, in the cities there may well be higher wages. The expected wage in the city is higher. But the likelihood that you're actually going to get a job may be much lower. So if everybody wants to be an actor, we all go to Vegas, and in your favorite actor, you may indeed get, if you become that actor or actress, you hit the jackpot. But there are many who never get there. I mean, they get to Vegas, but never become the famous actor. So high average wage, which attracts the, the migrants, but also higher unemployment, and thus sort of slum formation, etc. The other argument would be that it's actually much easier for migrants, for, for rural farmers, to find a job which matches their skills. So they may, they may actually find it easier to, to get to that place, to the job, and because they can keep connections with the hinterland, they can, their land tenure issues, they keep access to their land, uh, they maintain their social ties, so migration costs are less. So there are a number of reasons why it may be easier for poor people to actually get to a rural town 
where if they arrive there, they may then have a higher likelihood or, or an equal likelihood of getting a job. So you sort of have the probability of finding a job once you're there and the probability of getting there, which we call the latter one we call the size effect. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But these rural towns may well lead to lower agglomeration economies and thus a slower growth pattern. That's sort of the flip side of the argument. I've given you two arguments which are sort of from within, from within the city, from within the rural town. But of course, these activities, they sort of have externalities, they have effects on the hinterlands. And it may well be that if you have the big city, which is sort of vibrant, that pulls the whole hinterland in and creates demand for the goods and services produced in the, in the hinterland. So the rural and farm employment is really driven by the demand coming from the big city. Now, again, is that effect larger for a city or for a number of spread out secondary towns, which each have that effect on their hinterland? It may be not, not be as strong, but in this case, the coverage of the area may be much larger. These are sort of some ways to think about why a small town versus uh, a big city may have differential effects on, the, spay, on the, the pace of poverty reduction. But ultimately, these are empirical questions. So that's what we'd like to, to talk or to look into today. We're going to do this in two ways. Just we'll have a, a case study and we'll do some cross-country uh, regression. So looking at the cross-country experience. We're going to do very simple. We basically divide up the population in three groups. The people in agriculture. So if rural people in agriculture. Then you have people who are in non-agriculture. Some of them will be rural. And then some of them will be in secondary towns or very urban. And then the third group will be the people who live in cities larger than 1 million. This cutoff is simply chosen by the data, as determined by the data. We have basically, in practice, we'll just divide the population in three groups. We take the people who are employed in agriculture from the real data. We take the people living in the big cities, 1 million plus cities, from uh, UN World Urban or the Urbanization Prospects, and the rest is the missing middle. These are the people in the middle, which we sort of that is the residual, but I'll come back to that. So as I said, we'll do a first a simple case study from Kagera, and then look at the cross-country experience. In the cross-country experience, what we'll try to do is we basically do sort of a simple growth, poverty to growth elasticity with a little small twist on, on it. So this is the change in poverty. This is your growth. So if, now we look at where people move to, out of agriculture, they move out of agriculture into that, that middle, or they move out of agriculture into the metropoles. And the rate at which that happened, would that have an additional effect on poverty reduction? So controlling for growth and some other usual controls, country fixed effects, etc. Does it matter where people go to for poverty reduction is what we'll test eventually. But let's first tell some stories uh, from Kagera. Kagera is, is a province in the north of Tanzania. There was a survey done which was started in 91, 94, over that period, so about 20 years ago. And the households were revisited in 2010, so about 15 years later. What's quite unique about this survey is that not only were the households revisited, if they went back to the household and the household wasn't there, they would actually go and trace that household. They would actually trace all the individuals in that household. So they would go back, even if the household was there, but let's say the, the daughter and the son had left, they would actually go and visit, see where these people had gone through. So it's in a way, it's tracking individuals, so it's a panel of individuals. We have about 3,300 individuals' households, so it was actually the, the, the amount of attrition was, was quite small. Uh, Co-author Joachim de Wert, he actually lives in that area and is running, uh, has been running the survey from there. Now the area, broadly speaking, is, if you look at the, the broad socioeconomic indicators, it's not so different from the rest of Tanzania. That said, this is by no means meant to be representative as such for Tanzania, because there are also some peculiarities uh, to that region. Now, let's just look a bit at what, what happened to these sort of dynamic pairs. Where did these people move to? So people were in farming or were in the middle, and then they moved from the farm to the farm. So in 91, in that period, they were a farmer, and they were a farmer as well in 2010. Or they moved either to rural non non unemployment 
or to a small town, or they move to the city, in this case, Dar es Salaam, uh, Mwanza, or even uh, in Uganda, Kampala. This is the total sample. Basically, about 82% in 91, 94, so at the beginning, were farmers. That dropped substantially to 48%. So that's sort of what we have here. We clearly have a big move out of farming. Let's look at what happened to consumption of these people. Are we surprised? Going to the city pays. Their, their incomes for those who moved to the city increased by triple, basically, increased by 233%. Those who moved to the middle also saw their income go up quite a bit, less, but it doubled. My God, those who stayed in farming, only 61% increase. It's not so much. I would go to the city. That's what we would think. That's sort of how we think about these things. And here I want to do a little thought experiment for you. I was reading the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, so you'll decide for yourself if you're a fast or a slow thinker. There's a book by Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize laureate. And uh, Daniel was pretty frustrated with himself because he felt that his statistical intuition was not really up to par. And he thought that it was him. So basically, he started out testing this a bit to make sure what was happening, or whether this was him, was his problem, or whether it was a more widespread problem. So one of the experiments he, he talks about in the book, he says, you know, if you have this, this person, sort of an introvert person, doesn't talk to too many people, sort of always on his own, what do you think, what is more likely? Do you think that type of person is more likely to be a librarian, or do you think that type of person is more likely to be a farmer? You decide, and we'll come back. Come back to the story here. So basically, here we go. Very fast growth rate. But if you look at the contribution to total consumption growth in that sample, actually it was the middle who contributed 42%. The farmers, they both had the sort of the same. While their growth rate was much less, they still contributed 18%. And the farmers moving to the city, they also contributed an 18%. So a big difference here. Grow fast growth rate, but the real contribution came from people moving to the middle. Let's go to poverty. What happened in terms of poverty? Yes, people who moved to the city, they left poverty. No poverty left. But look at this number here, 434. There were 945, about 30 percentage point, 28 percentage point reduction in poverty. And basically, you get almost half of the people who left poverty, who exited poverty, were people who moved to that middle. Also here, 300 out of 945. So one in three farmers almost left exited poverty by staying in farming. And only one in seven, 113 over 945. One in seven people exited poverty by moving to the city. Go back to your thought experiment. What was more likely? Actually, it could, might well be more likely to be a farmer because there are many more farmers then there are librarians in the population. And even though there are only very few of these are likely to be that introvert type, as a whole, you may still be more, more likely to be a farmer. Just want to bring out this idea here. What's driving this is the share in the population. Just many more people. Even the farmers, they have one in three exit poverty. There's just many more of them. Then people are moving to the city. Now, so what do we take away from this thought ex experiment? So almost one in two individuals move out of poverty by moving to the middle. Only one out of seven did so by moving to the city. And in this, this is there's no economics, simple descriptive table. We sort of abstract from how the city may have affected growth in the rural hinterland and vice versa. The other thing when I say looking at the likelihood, sort of the likelihood of finding a job, there is sort of a sign that these are the number percent of people who are unemployed. And so this, that rate is slightly higher than those who moved to the middle or were farmers. I've only done half of the presentation, so I need to go fast now and get to the punchline. So basically, I now look at this equation. So controlling for growth, does it matter where people move to? So we're basically looking at whether these coefficients are the same. 
So basically whether it matters where you go out of agriculture into the middle or out of agriculture into the metropole. This is the baseline result. But basically, it, there is an growth, reduces poverty, the $1 a day, $2 a day, and there's an additional effect of, of uh, moving to that middle on the rate of poverty reduction. We do a whole series of robustness tests to these results, which we can talk about uh, later on. They're, they're, they're shown here. Uh, we also look whether it's more likely that it is the size effect or the harris todoro effect. We do find more sign of the size effect that it's, that it's easier for people to actually, likely more, it's easier for them to move to that, that place as opposed to once they're there that they have a higher likelihood of finding a job. So the unemployment rates are not that different across these jobs. But I want to sort of, this is still all controlling for growth. So you may well say the agglomeration, effect works through the growth channel and you only have a lagged effect in the next round. So one simple way of testing that is by just rerunning this regression without growth and you still see this effect of uh, the share of the middle uh, dominating so that, that it seems to work a lot. Moving to that middle has, has an, important, uh, an important factor. Two final points, sort of to look at this idea a bit further, is it indeed the case we look at the Gini, we look at is there a correlation between living in the middle and the share of people in the metropoles and uh, the Gini coefficients. And basically you find countries with a higher metropolitan share of the population are indeed have higher Gini. So there is sort of an idea, it works through inequality increasing, there is an inequality channel. At the same time, the flip side of this, that remember the agglomeration economies, we do indeed find this is a growth regression, a simple one, but there is sort of a signs of a correlation here as well between being in the, or that change rate or the metropolitization, if you wish, it sort of has a higher effect on growth than a move of people to, to the middle. This is my last slide. So basically to conclude here, what we sort of want to bring to the table with this paper is basically shift the conversation a little bit. That urbanization is one thing, but we need to go beyond that. We need to think about the nature of the urbanization that may well matter for the pace of poverty reduction. We sort of, in this paper, sort of cross-country exper experience as well as to some case studies, that migration out of agriculture in that middle that may well be as associated with faster poverty reduction than agglomeration in the megacities. But the big question, of course, if you were to believe this, how do you do it? And that's for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,